Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's taking a look at a Luger. This is a Simpson & Co. Luger, and what makes this interesting is that uh, Simpson is the one company that was authorized to actually do military firearms uh, manufacture and reworking for the German army between the two world wars, mostly in the 1920s. Uh, the Versailles Treaty had put into effect severe limitations on the German arms industry. Basically they wanted to say, nein, <laughs> Germany cannot make any military arms whatsoever. But you can't quite do that because, well, Germany has to have some sort of armed forces for, uh, you know, internal policing and control and border defense, and if they didn't let the Germans do any of that, well then, my goodness, the French would have to pay for it, or the British would have to pay for it and do it, and we can't, we don't want that. So the Germans were allowed to have a very limited military capacity, and part of that is they had to have some way to actually build and rebuild military firearms. So um, in the 1920s there was a program, uh, basically there was a contract put out for German military arms repair and manufacture and Simpson & Co. won it. So who is Simpson? Because they're not, you'd think this contract would go to one of the big players, like Mauser or DWM, and it didn't. Uh, Simpson, to go back to its origins, was founded in 1847 by a Jewish family, and in 1847 a Prussian law was put into place that basically gave Jews full rights of citizenship. Like, not quite complete, but really close to it. And they were, among other things, allowed to get into basically any line of business that they wanted, just like everyone else. And so two brothers, Loeb and Moses uh, Simpson, got into the metalworking business, which was a bit of a challenge at the time. Sewell, uh, down in southern Germany where they were located, wasn't particularly competitive in this, but the two brothers did quite well. Within ten years, by 1857, they were a substantial subcontractor for parts in the firearms industry and they would build that business. Uh, by the late 1800s Simpson was a major manufacturer of guns like the uh, 1888 Commission Gewehr, the Reichs revolvers, they made a bunch of Nagant revolvers under contract, as well as doing parts for a lot of other people. Um, business tailed off a little bit after uh, the, the Mauser 98 was introduced because Simpson was not one of the manufacturers for it, but of course things picked back up during World War I and they started manufacturing Gewehr 98s. Uh, the German military of course needed everything it could get its hands on. They expanded somewhat, they started doing artillery sighting systems. This was a, a flexible and dynamic company. Um, they had good technology, they were always at the forefront of material science and new processes and manufacturing techniques. They made really good products. And so in that light it's a little less surprising that they would end up with this contract uh, during the, the Weimar period, under the limitations of the Versailles Treaty. Uh, in addition there is some suggestion that they actually had some political connections with the guys who were uh, making the decision on the contract, which would certainly not be surprising for that time period. Uh, it is honestly a little surprising that someone like Mauser or DWM didn't have those kind of connections. But ultimately Sewell gets the contract, and one of the guns that they are going to be responsible for making is the Luger. So before this had even happened, about 1920 apparently, uh, Simpson got the tooling for the Luger from the Erfurt arsenal. This would be right in the aftermath of the war when the arsenal was being uh, shut down by the Allied powers. Now it's interesting to point out that there have only ever been four sets of Luger production tooling made. There was of course the first one made by DWM who started building the guns, the second one was produced uh, at the Erfurt arsenal to make more Lugers uh, for the German military. Uh, the third set was actually sort of related. The, the Erfurt tooling of course went to Simpson, and then uh, in 1934 after we'll get to this in a moment, after the demise of Simpson, that tooling was actually loaned to the Krieghoff company, who didn't use it directly themselves, but because by that time it was quite old and worn out, but instead they used it as the basis to make their own set of tooling to produce the Luger, that would be the third set. Um, and Krieghoff did not make that many Lugers, but they put in the money to actually build a complete set of tooling for them. Uh, and then the fourth set was actually built by the Swiss, uh, for the at the Waffenfabrik Bern factory to make the 1929 pattern Swiss pistols. So those are the only four sets of Luger production tooling that have ever been made. Um, 
all of the other Lugers that you ever see will have actually been made on one of those sets of tooling. Anyway, uh, 1925 Simpson gets, well Simpson starts actually producing Lugers, and the first two years, 1925 and 1926, they date the, the uh, barrel extensions of their guns, after that they're undated. So with all of that backstory in place, let's take a look at this one. This is actually a 1926 dated gun, which is the very rarest variation of Simpson Lugers. This is actually the rarest sub-variant, as I think I said, of uh, Simpson Lugers. It is a 1926 dated gun. So when production began in 1925, uh, all the guns were dated like this. They made about 600 of them dated 1925, uh, with serial numbers running from 1 to 600. They did about another 100 in 1926 that were dated like this one, running up into approximately serial number 700, and then the remainder of the guns were undated. Uh, they're just totally blank, uh, blank chambers. There would be a total production of about 11,900, just under 12,000 of these guns total. Uh, once they broke through the 10,000 mark they added a letter suffix, so the last 2,000 or so uh, have an A suffix to them. They have primarily, there are some, there are some exceptions, there are some other sub-variations that we're not going to talk about today, uh, but in general these have a toggle that is marked Simpson and Company of Sewell, and we have the last two digits of the serial number, which contradicts what I just said about the date ranges. So this is serial number 424, which should be a 1925 gun. Uh, this is a gun that is actually specifically called out in the primary book on this subject, uh, Simpson Lugers by Edward Tinker and Graham Johnson. And what it almost certainly is, is a gun that initially failed its quality control check and was set aside, and was not actually quite finished until 1926. So it has a serial number that would place it in 1925 production, but it wasn't actually completed until the next year. Production began relatively late in uh, 1925, we think. This hypothesis is supported by this little proof mark right there, which is so tiny my camera has a hard time even zooming in on it. That is a little eagle over an RC, and the RC stands for Revisions Commission. Uh, and this is a stamp that was used uh, during the Imperial period, as well as during the Weimar period, and it basically applied to a part that was really close to not being within tolerance. And when, if a part was really close, they'd send it to the Revisions Commission to check with a whole bunch of gauges to see if the part was usable or not. If it was, it got an RC stamp, which basically absolved the general uh, weapons inspector from responsibility if the gun failed for some reason in the field. So RC means, yeah, this part's good to go, it's close, but it's usable. And having that stamp on here would be uh, a, a good reason why this gun might have taken a little bit longer to actually get finished. Uh, the rest of the marks on here are typical uh, interwar proof marks. You'll see we have a serial number on the frame, as is typical for Lugers. We've got a plethora of serial numbers all over the place, they're all 24, 424, so they, they just use the last two digits up here, side plate, disassembly lever, you name it. We have a full serial number on the barrel, along with a bore measurement of 8.8 millimeters, uh, which is that's normal and appropriate. Um, that is the land to land, uh, or the groove to groove diameter, which is slightly smaller than the bullet diameter of 9 millimeter. Uh, the six there is a, an eagle over six proof mark, which we see here on the opposite side of the barrel extension. So. Uh, we have Eagle 6, Eagle 33, Eagle 6, and then another Eagle as a final proof mark. Uh, the Germans really did like their proof marks. The grips are also both numbered on the inside. This one, the 2, is a little fuzzy, but uh, it's pretty clear on the other grip, uh, 24. Simpson of course also made magazines, and their typical magazines use an aluminum follower. This one is a wood follower, which is much less common, but uh, still authentic. Uh, this would have been a rebuilt follower. So something happened to the magazine and they had to repair it, and they used a wood base plate. So it is numbered there. We have, again, our there we go, Eagle 6 proof mark there, and another little tiny bitty Eagle 6 proof mark there. In terms of general configuration, these are just standard PO8 Lugers. It's the standard army pattern, that's what was being made. Um, a number of Simpson Lugers were used by the German police, various agencies of the German police 
Um, it's a minority of them, most of them went to the army. Unlike most of the other contractors, most of the other manufacturers, there were no commercial Simpson Lugers made, so they didn't sell them to the public, uh, which is um, atypical for Luger manufacturers in general. And with less than 12,000 made, these are in fact the smallest scale production Luger of all of the companies. Uh, even Krieghoff made, made more guns than Simpson. Uh, it's interesting that the collector's market doesn't tends, tends to value the Krieghoff ones higher than Simpson's, despite the fact that uh, Simpson is lower production and, to my mind, more interesting with everything that was going on uh, during the, the Weimar period uh, and, and the, the restrictions under the Versailles Treaty. Simpson did really quite well during this interwar period. They're, they initially hadn't really had high expectations for this military contract, because there really wasn't a lot of military stuff going on. Um, and that changed fairly quickly. Uh, in particular, there was a training accident uh, with machine guns, in which a worn out machine gun barrel had a way larger area of dispersion than it should have, and an errant bullet killed a prominent officer. And this led the German government, the German military, to replace something like 10,000 machine gun barrels with new, not worn out barrels, and those were all produced by Simpson, which was quite a windfall for them. Uh, in total, between 1924 and 1934, they would produce like 68% of all German uh, military equipment, military arms contracts. It was quite a lot of business. And this kind of set them up in a position to be viewed uh, with some envy and jealousy by a lot of the rest of the industry, especially in southern Germany. Uh, why should they get to have this monopoly on military contracts? Uh, and in particular the fact that the Simpsons were a Jewish family would come back to haunt them uh, when the Nazis started to come to power. In particular there was a Gauleiter, a uh, district governor, uh, down in Thuringia by the name of Fritz Saukel, who really had it out for the Simpson company and the Simpson family. Uh, in the mid-1930s he launched a major investigation to try and prove corruption or bribery or basically anything that he could. Um, was unable to actually find any hard evidence, but didn't let that stop him from arresting Arthur uh, Simpson, the, who was in charge, the owner of the company at that time, and a bunch of his high management employees. Uh, threw them in, you know, indicted them on charges of corruption, uh, arrested a couple of Simpson's relatives to put pressure on him, and ultimately forced him to sign a, a confession to corruption of some sort. Um, and give up control of the company in exchange for being let out of prison, which he did, and he and his family promptly fled over the border to Switzerland and thence to the United States, where incidentally he would live for the rest of his life into the 1960s. Uh, once, once the Simpsons were effectively out of the picture, Saukel uh, nationalized the company, turned it into, renamed it BSW, um, and it then became uh, also known by the term uh, Gustav Werke, after a Nazi martyr by the name of Gustav, um, who was killed in, I think in 1936, a little bit later. At any rate, um, so when you see later World War II German production, when you see things that are from Gustav Werke or from BSW, that is in fact the Simpson Company uh, production, that's their factory complex. Um, after World War II this would be once <laughs> yet again taken over. Uh, Sewell was in the Soviet area of occupation after World War II. There were initially some plans to just completely demolish uh, the, the Guslov BSW factory. That was not done, however the Soviets did basically take all of the useful machine tools, some 4,000 plus uh, machine tools out of the factory and exported them back to Russia to use themselves. Uh, the gun making uh, would be turned over to what became the Ernst Tallman uh, factory in East Germany. So you'll see some of those guns or production from that factory, and that is again the same factory that was originally Sewell. Uh, Simpson, sorry, in Sewell. So that is, I suppose, the rather extended story of uh, Simpson and Company of Sewell and their rather rare and interesting interwar Luger pistols. So hopefully you guys found this interesting and not too terribly dull. Uh, thanks for watching.